Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of This Week in FCPA. This Week in FCPA is sponsored by Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance program, visit our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. In this episode, we look at Jeff Kaplan's question of how deep is the ocean in the context of President Trump's conflicts of interest why there is no easy answer to supply side of bribery. Matthew Stevenson says it's time to retire the term passive bribery. What about the use of monitors and licensing and discipline proceedings? Jay continues his exploration on this topic. Deutsche Bank settles its sons and daughters hiring case, a fraud allegation which hits academia. What happens when the middle of your organization is rotten? And what are some of the issues for AI in compliance? We look at my five-part podcast series, The Science of Star Trek, the original series. Once again, listeners to this podcast can receive a complimentary pass to Converge 19, the great event that Conversant will be holding in Denver on October 2nd and 3rd, and all the week's other top compliance and ethics commentary. We consider the five episodes of Adventures in Compliance and the intersection of Sherlock Holmes and compliance programs, and also a few words about Converge 19. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist and the Voice of Compliance, back again with Jay Rose and Mr. Monitors for This Week in FCPA, episode 169 for the week ending August 30, 2019, the How Deep is the Ocean edition. As Donald Trump has invited Russia back into the G7 and plans a summit at his resort next uh, year, Jay and I are back to take a look at potential conflicts of interest and all of the above and discuss some of the week's other top compliance and ethics stories. So, Jay, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Shall we dive right in? Let's do it. So uh, this is a great article. This comes to us from our colleague Jeff Kaplan. And it's entitled, How Deep is the Ocean? The Latest on Trump's Conflicts of Interest. And as Tom just referred to, uh, the president has visited his properties 362 times at taxpayers' expense, sometimes visiting for more than a single day. In 2019 alone, he has visited his properties 81 times. Uh, To go over some more facts and figures, 111 officials from 65 foreign governments, including 57 foreign countries, have made 137 trips. The article goes on to detail which, how many members of Congress, how many state officials, and how many foreign officials have dropped coin at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. And um, this is a stupendous record of corruption, and one that, as the report notes, is likely incomplete. And the report was done by an organization called CREW, which is Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. And as Tom noted, our uh, wonderful president, Always Schilling, suggested that they should use his Florida resort next year for the G7 meeting. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, Next up, kind of on the same line, uh, we have something that's we've had in the last couple of weeks taking a look at the demand side of bribery. This comes to us from the FCPA blog with Jessica Tillipman, who is senior editor for the FCPA blog and assistant dean at George Washington University Law School. And um, basically, the majority of foreign officials who demand bribes uh, tend to do this and act with impunity, but foreign officials who take bribes often share a portion of their illegal proceeds with their superiors and bribe-taking officials. 
Uh, even when the demand side enforcement action takes place, the officials are rarely sanctioned. According to an OECD report from 2018, only one-fifth of the 55 schemes covered by OECD survey was there actual any enforcement. Uh, this could be changing as um, the Foreign Extortion Prevention Act, FEPA, or FIPA, I guess, targets foreign officials who demand or accept bribes in return for filling for fulfilling, neglecting, or violating their duties. As one of the bill's co-sponsor, Representative John Curtis, Republic of Utah, explained, currently a business being extorted for a bribe can only say, I can't pay you a bribe because it's illegal and I might get arrested. But now that statement will be amended by this new long overdue bill, which would enable them to add, and so will you. Uh, critics may argue that the corrupt officials are unlikely to be expedited, but uh, there are two ways where it can impact them. It might be able to curtail their travel, and if they're not able to travel, they might not be able to um, use their ill-gotten gains. There is one flaw within the legislation, and that comes under uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 201, which is widely considered the centerpiece of U.S. domestic anti-bribery legislation. And foreign officials now face a different standard of liability than companies or individuals who fall within the purview of the FCPA. But we're hopeful that that gap will be closed up in the future. So um, very interesting thing, and I think there'll be more to be coming uh, on the uh, demand side of bribery. And we have something similar that you're going to speak about in the next article, Tom. So, Jay, uh, this came in uh, too late for us to get it in last week's show, but uh, that well-known ethical organization that is uh, rarely in the news, Deutsche Bank, uh, was actually fined uh, $16 million last week in a sons and daughters hiring case, or what Harry Casson, writing in the FCPA blog, called referral hiring. And this was just an effort by Deutsche Bank to engage in bribery and corruption by hiring the sons and daughters of foreign officials and of employees of state-owned enterprises uh, to get to garner contracts and services. Uh, we do not have the infamous spreadsheet uh, that uh, J.P. Morgan had where they uh, tracked uh, the son and daughter uh, with the business opportunity, nor we have uh, other spreadsheets from other companies which actually looked at the ROI of hiring the uh, son and daughter. But... Um, Clearly, we had uh, hires that were made uh, outside the standard uh, hiring parameters of Deutsche Bank. Uh, one candidate was an average-level candidate uh, who failed two tests around analysis yet and was recommended she not be hired yet. She was hired. And my favorite was one of the Russian corrupt hires in London performed so poorly that he was deemed, quote, to be a liability to the reputation of the program, if not the firm, end quote. Um, so when you hire people like that, uh, it's clearly not for their technical competence or their business acumen, and uh, it's for another reason, and, and unfortunately Deutsche Bank was, was caught up in that. So uh, Deutsche Bank continues to be in the news, uh, AML, FCPA, perhaps for some other reasons uh, that we'll talk about later. But uh, and I guess uh, the finally the most damning thing, Jay, was that uh, Deutsche Bank had defined anything of value to specifically include job offers uh, in 2009 and made this even uh, more uh, specifically applicable to APAC, Asia Pacific region in 2010. But um, it did not uh, start uh, following this until 2015. So a lot of internal dissonance in the company. And uh, once banks, again, yet another um, sons and daughter cases. We rarely have breaking news on the uh, This Week in FCPA because we are a wrap-up. But today, literally within the past hour uh, before we recorded this, Jupiter Network announced that they had, uh, or the SEC had announced that Jupiter Network had settled its FCPA uh, outstanding uh, matter. The company settled for $11.7 million. It related to sales practices in Russia and China. Uh, it was with the SEC only. Uh, <clears throat> from 2008 to 2013, employees of the Ju Juniper's Russian subsidiary 
agreed with third-party partners to increase the discounts on sales without passing these along to the customers. These off-book funds were referred to as common funds and then were paid out as bribes. Uh, that included foreign officials uh, sending uh, being sent to locations where there are no Jupiter facilities or in industry conferences related to Juniper's abilities. These um, uh, in China from 2009 to 2013, sales employees of the company falsified trip and meeting agendas for customers, including public officials, by understating the real value of these uh, trips. Uh, one of the most damaging things I thought was that. When uh, regarding the common funds, uh, Juniper learned of these in 2009, uh, but they continued to allow this to fester until 2013. Even more uh, uh, damaging was that the Chinese sales reps submitted their falsified agendas to Juniper's legal department for approval, and the legal department approved these trips without adequate review after the events had taken place. So a relatively small fine. I have not had the uh, chance to review the order, so I can't really go into the details around that. But this has been a long-standing case. Uh, one more uh, off the books. Uh, I have to note the fine appears to be relatively low, um, so that may be a harbinger of FCPA fines going forward. Department moves to a, a little bit more light touch on enforcement. Great. Well, this week uh, we'll turn to... Um my continuing series on uh, the healthcare sector that's been running on corporate compliance insights. And this week I took a look at monitors and licensing and disciplinary proceedings. And uh, basically uh, we took a look at how independent integrity monitors can be used in healthcare licensing and disciplinary proceedings. Um, this example that I took a look at was a licensing and disciplining a disciplinary pr proceeding and a hypothetical situation where state Medicaid fraud unit control finds that a provider is billing for an unusually high number of patients or procedures per day. Um, such a settlement will allow the uh, provider of the clinic to continue practicing, which is important for many Medicare providers. Keeping a Medicaid practice open is often crucial in some areas, especially those areas that are very undisturbed. Um, so basically, uh, by keeping or bringing up such a healthcare provider professional uh, standards, it's important to the local or state health board that wants to make sure that uh, patients are being served. Uh, another scenario sometimes occurs when a complaint is made to a licensing board the complaint is investigated and the licensing board finds, among other things, that the practitioner's patient records lack basic elements, for example, adequate notes about treatments. Uh, here, an independent integrity monitor can be an excellent option as it allows healthcare providers to continue to practice while providing prompt feedback to the agency about whether the healthcare provider is making changes. So as part of a multi-pronged approach to the opioid abuse issue, many states are looking to see if their high prescribers are and whether there are legitimate practices or just pill mills. In this situation, a monitor can help a provider to put policies and procedures in place. So uh, we have basically have said that an independent integrity monitor can help keep regulators informed as most state agencies do not have the available staff to track compliance with details, and furthermore, the cost of the monitor, monitor is borne by the uh, patient who is uh, being monitored, and it has no impact upon uh, government funds. So next week, we're going to continue on with integrity modding, monitoring within the healthcare and take a look at how we can use non-disciplinary administrative proceedings and how the monitor can be a solution there. Jay, we had a, uh, a, a fraud scandal in academia. You want to tell us about that? Uh, yeah, this one was kind of interesting. And, you know, uh, Jonathan Rush always really brings articles here that you don't really see in the mainstream press. Uh, this comes to us. Uh, the University of Kansas had a professor who was indicted for fraud based on the failure to disclose that the professor was already being paid by a Chinese university. 
On August 21st, the U.S. Department of Justice announced that a federal grand jury in the District of Kansas indicted Fung Franklin Dow, a University of Kansas Associated Professor and Researcher at the Kansas University Center for Environmentally Beneficial Catalysts. In May 2008, Dow had signed a five-year con uh, contract with Fuzhou University in China that designated him as uh, Cheng Zheng Scholar and Distinguished Professor. Uh, he took the job subsequently at Kansas University and neglected to uh, let the university know that he already was being paid by a Chinese university. During his tenure at KU, he fraudulently received more than 37000 in salary paid for by the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. Uh, now, Jonathan adds, at first glance, it may appear unusual that the DOJ would take the trouble to obtain an indictment against an individual for a conflict of interest involving this fairly modest amount, but he feels two actors may be at play here and led to the decision to indict. First, given his full-time position at Fuso University, prosecutors may have been concerned that if no charges were pending against him, that Dow would take the opportunity to flee the U.S. The second point is some media have reported that the Dow indictment is part of an FBA push to target ethnic Chinese scientists working in the U.S., who are believed to be passing secrets to China. So, in any event, this case provides counsel at public and private universities with a timely opportunity to remind their staff of their obligations to disclose all reportable conflicts of interest. Mike Volkov had an interesting article that, article that I'd like uh, to discuss, Jay, because uh, it's entitled, When Company Supervisors and Managers Engage in Misconduct, it's a really interesting look at a topic that I don't think we've really explored, uh, uh, certainly on this podcast or really perhaps in many other areas, which is uh, misconduct by middle managers. We certainly talk about tone at the top. We talk about misconduct at the top. We talk about, we have talked about FCPA enforcement actions <clears throat> where there was C-suite involvement. But we really don't talk, I think, enough about middle managers and supervisors. And Mike uh, really doesn't look at it in terms of uh, people like uh, in those positions who may have engaged in bribery and corruption and led to an FCPA violation. He talks about it in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh, actions by uh, middle management and supervisory employees which destroy trust in the employee base and that the uh, – uh, folks at the bottom of the pyramid who uh, are really the eyes and ears of the company and who see and know as, as much as anyone, it's going to make them reluctant to speak up and to raise their hand and to go in and tell their supervisor that they've observed a violation of the code of conduct or a violation of company ethical standards. And so uh, I thought um, it was really good for Mike to focus on that. And it leads to really perhaps two considerations. One is additional training to that level of management, middle management and supervisors, but also compliance officers and even more uh, pointedly HR uh, personnel need to take a look at who uh, the people that, that staff those positions. And if you have people who are engaging in bribery and corruption, if you have people who are uh, ethically challenged or suspect or maybe have a, a flexible ethical standard around business transactions, those people may not be appropriate for not only your company, but for those positions as well. So I thought it was a great uh, lesson to think about and not something that <clears throat> we've really talked about uh, enough, probably. Yeah, one interesting uh, number that uh, Mike quoted was he said, um, one of the many risks to these cultural requirements is the existence of supervisor misconduct. Ethics surveys often report supervisor or managerial misconduct rates between 40 and 60 percent. This is troubling as a large percentage of employees do not report misconduct to their direct supervisors. So that's a pretty stunning number if half of all the um, issues of misconduct are going unreported. So it really... I think for Mike to look at this is, is really an eye-opener because we like 
often look at the people who are on the front line, but now in this situation we talk about where middle management stands and how they could potentially deter people who want to do the right thing. Tom, this week you had a very interesting um, series that you've been doing about AI. Do you want to share some thoughts with it uh, with our listeners? Yeah, Jay. So last week I did a uh, multi-part blog post series around Harvard Business Review's a special section in their most recent issue on white-collar crime. And this week I took the same approach with a special report that was found in the most recent issue of the MIT Sloan Management Review, which was making good on the promise of AI. And I took the articles as a starting point for a discussion of bringing AI into the compliance discipline, into the corporate compliance function, and some of the things that you need to consider. So I started off with uh, strategies both for and with AI, and I was particularly struck by that phrase uh, because are you thinking that uh, your strategy will be for AI or really with AI? And I think it, it succinctly articulates what many people misapprehend about AI, that AI is simply a tool to be utilized and the professional compliance practitioner needs to be a part of that. Uh, next, we looked at uh, using uh, AI uh, strategies rather for implementation. <clears throat> and I took a pretty ma- ma- macro level look at how a compliance, a chief compliance officer or compliance practitioner should uh, think through a AI implementation. <clears throat> and then yesterday and today, I took a look at <clears throat> that same topic, but from a much more macro uh, uh, process. So I looked at uh, yesterday the capabilities your compliance function needs to put AI into place in the compliance function. And then in tomorrow's uh, final edition, I'm going to take a look at the individual uh, strategies for implementation that you need to, or rather the practices for implementation that you need to do. So it was a lot of fun. It's something that uh, I've been interested in writing about for some time, but I really want to start seeing if I can uh, develop a, a, a practical, not so much theory, but a practical approach for compliance practitioners to take because one of the things that's clear from from the research I did for this series is this is really a, a very large effort. It's a large effort in terms of your time commitment. It's a large effort in terms of your resources commitment. And it's also... Um, Jay, a, a large commitment because it requires a skill set that lawyers who are compliance practitioners don't generally have, and many compliance practitioners who may be from other corporate disciplines may not have as well. So um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it, and I'm going to continue to uh, explore this, but uh, check it out. It's uh, running uh, this week on the FCPA Compliance Report, and if I could just jump right into the podcast series uh, I, I uh, highlighted this week, this one was just a ton and a half of fun, Jay, where I looked at the science of Star Trek, and it was privileged to have Ben Lockwin, and I was somewhat, um, what's the right word? Uh, well, uh, it turns out Ben has a PhD in astrophysics, <laughs> which I did not know. I only knew he had a PhD in uh, pharmaceutical uh, and behavioral science. Uh, so he has two. Uh, but... He's very knowledgeable about the science of Star Trek, the original series, and we just went to town on it. Rather, I listened to Ben go to town on it. So we looked at uh, transporters, phasers, warp drive, black holes, white holes, wormholes, tricorders, all of the cool science and stuff that uh, existed in the original series, many of which were brought forward into subsequent Star Trek series. And Ben took a look at it, what's feasible, what's reasonable, what could be done, uh, what really can't be done, what what really is science fiction, um, and what's really right around the corner. So it's a fascinating series. Ben uh, is a very knowledgeable guy um, and uh, very uh, articulate, one of the, the top speakers around. So uh, had a lot of fun with it, Jay. Sounds like a, a great listen. Uh, Tom and I wanted to share a great opportunity with our listeners that uh, we will be in Denver at the beginning of October on the 2nd and 3rd, and we'll be attending uh, Conversance Converge 19. 
And uh, Tom has a special offer for the listeners of our podcast. Been given a limited number of complimentary tickets. And so if you uh, want to go uh, at no cost, use the, the uh, code FOXVIP. It's in the show notes. We've also linked to registration information. Frankly, uh, Jay, this uh, event is just getting better and better. Uh, I'm helping uh, conversant uh uh, publicize it a little bit more by doing a series of podcasts with the uh, speakers. So I've been uh, recording those over the past week, and those will go up starting next week. But I really learned some really cutting edge stuff that's going to be talked about: psychology, tactics, training, communications, um, te- uh, tech tools, uh, just a wide variety of things. This is going to be one of the top compliance conferences. And if you really want sort of an A level. Uh, PhD level uh, compliance conference. This is going to be the one for you. And when you can go at no charge, uh, it's even going to be better. And as Jay is as great as those educational se- sessions will be, I think uh, certainly one of the things that you do cor- incredibly well at conferences is network, but not network simply around business development, network around what's cutting edge, what are people doing, what are the new tools, ta- tactics, and strategies that are being used. We're going to have focused uh, uh, groups, industry groups, practice groups, and area groups at lunch tables so that people can really share best practices. The uh, conversations on the uh, in between uh, the breakout sessions uh, around coffee and uh, the refreshments that they're going to have, I think, are going to be some of the most interesting because everyone is going to be uh, – uh, really motivated to to learn to hear about what's going on in the industry, and it's going to be a way for you to really up your game, but also take away things are that people are doing in our industry that you may not have thought of or you may not have done in your corporation that could be tried at little to no cost. So I'm going to present some ideas uh, around. Um, transaction monitoring and and how you can utilize the data that's in your corporate data lake uh, similar to that. So, Jay, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I know you're going to be there. Uh, your colleague Eric Feldman's going to be there. Mike Bolkoff's going to be there. Uh, our colleague Sarah Haddon and Mike Kelly, Matt Kelly, are going to be there. And so last, last let me plug uh, Everything Compliance. We'll be doing a live podcast at uh, Converge 19 and uh, this is going to be way too much fun, and I hope uh, if I hope you'll come, and I hope you will sit in for our first live Everything Compliance podcast. So, um, looking forward to it, Jay, and it's going to be great. Yeah. So, as we said, that's just about a month away. Uh, as we come to the end of August, I am uh, excited with the start of the NFL football season, and I guess this season starts college football. And uh, Tom, since I've uh, Checked out on MLB. Uh, what's the uh, Astros report? So the Astros now have the best record in the American League. We've overtaken the Yankees. Um, and um, looking forward to take, bringing it back home to Houston, Texas, where it belongs. Did uh, somebody get suspended this week or thrown out of a game? Uh, yeah, Justin Verlander apparently said one of the two words you can't say. Uh, not just on TV and radio, but to an umpire. <laughs> and uh, he got tossed. So is it a, just a game? He, he misses like one one, ro- one spin through the rotation? or No, he just he got just, tossed from that game. Okay. Oh, well, that's, so that's he, nothing. He, he missed a call, strike three. The, ne- uh, the next pitch, the guy hit a homer, and apparently something was said. Uh, I would be pretty upset if that happened to me. With that, I would like to thank you for joining uh, Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist, and myself, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor, for this week in FCPA, episode 169, the How Deep is the Ocean edition. Uh, Please have a safe and happy Labor Day, and we will talk to you next in the month of September. Take care. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions, you can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. I'm at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Once again, I hope you'll take advantage of the limited number of free passes I have to Converge 19 by uh, using the uh, registration code FOXVIP. 
Thanks again for listening to This Week in FCPA, and I hope you'll join Jay and I again next week where we take a look at some of the top compliance and ethics stories which caught our collective eye. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio.